We're going to move on now to talk about uh, supervised learning again. And I want to introduce in the next two lectures two of the most important workhorses of industry, or at least they were the workhorses in the industry in deep, until deep neural nets came along, uh, the support vector machine and classification trees. So up until deep neural networks came along, they were sort of in some sense the two dominant paradigms for going to large-scale data and getting the very best results possible for classification and clustering. Great supervised algorithms, and I want to walk through some of the mathematical detail of them, of course, based on uh, optimization procedures, and I want to just walk through some of these. So again, most of the details here from the book, Data-Driven Science and Engineering at databookuw.com. So let's talk about this. So this is going to be one of the really important canonical supervised learning techniques, support vector machine. So I want to talk about what this terminology means and talk about the optimization procedure and then show you how you actually can execute this in MATLAB very easily. And there's a very simple equivalent in, in scikit-learn and Python. So the idea here is the following. I have data. This is what we've been playing around with. And what I have here are the magenta and the green balls, which typically we've been talking about, you know, something like dogs versus cats. And the goal here is to find a vector, a hyperplane, or in this case, since it's two-dimensional, just a line that separates those green from magenta balls. Now what's interesting about the support vector is this W, which tells me how to get out here to, to characterize this line, is basically uh, the support vector. And so in fact, what we want to look at here is I want to not only find this line, but you see this margin here, I want to penalize everything to keep those balls out of, out of, out of this margin. So my goal is to maximize this margin. So in this data, what I'd like to do is figure out how do I construct this line such that my margins are as big as possible. So here is a good representation of the SVM. Here is a poor representation. Notice that both of them in training, if this was my real data, would give me perfect separation of the data, right? If you look here, the data is perfectly separated by that line as well as this line. But here, the margins, look at the margin here versus look at the margin there. So my goal is then to find a line, a W vector, that will allow me, and NB, that will allow me to basically figure out how to opt <coughs> optimize that margin. Excuse me. Okay, so that is the goal. So we're going to go after this and try to train this here um, and figure out how to set that up as an optimization routine. By the way, um, notice that the margin has all the balls to the right or to the left of the margin. But in practice, you know, we've already seen data where the magenta and green balls overlap on each other's sides. So what you do is you penalize any single ball that is across that line, right? So you've obviously would like to not have any balls from the green on this side, no magenta balls on that side, but the penalization uh, that you would impose on the in the optimization would handle that and try to do the best job it can in separating those. So we're going to first start off with this idea of a linear support vector machine, which is exactly what I just showed you, which is say, all right, I'm going to try to find this hyperplane separating the two parts of the data that give me a maximal cushion on each side uh, so I can really maximize that margin. So this linear plane of hyperseparation, the important thing that's going to happen here is once I define this plane, what I'm really going to look at is then my labels are going to be y, which is a function of wx plus b, which is actually just the sign of wx plus b. So plus 1 or minus 1. <clears throat> so I'm going to just going to take the sign. So if I'm on the hyperplane, this is 0. If I'm on one side, it's plus one. If I'm on, sorry, if I'm on one side, this is positive. If I'm on the other side, it's negative, and I will just take positive or negatives and make them one or minus one. In other words, the labels of the dogs and the cats. 
Okay, so this is in fact my output that comes from knowing my hyperplane. It's an integer, plus one, minus one, or whatever, you, however you choose to frame your classification. So this leads us to be able to formulate, in fact, the loss function we need for the optimization procedure. So the loss function is given here, and I'm looking at y of j, y bar of j. So when I train this, yj is going to be the truth. In other words, I've given you a training data with labels. So I know what the y of j's are supposed to be. y bar of j is my approximation to the label given my hyperplane, the sign of the hyperplane, which side of that hyperplane I'm on. So this is what I think the label is, y bar. This is what it actually is. So this thing is actually zero if, in fact, I got it right and plus one if I got it wrong. So in other words, this is a more succinct way to say this. It's this loss function is zero. If you labeled a piece of data correctly, it's plus one if you labeled it incorrectly. So obviously everything you get wrong, you hit a penalty of plus one. Okay? So, uh, and of course, the more you hit wrong, the higher your losses are gonna be. So we wanna basically minimize over those losses, and here is the linear SVM optimization model that you can write down for this. Minimize this loss function with the, the norm of that W vector as well. So you also make this as small as possible if you can, subject to a constraint, okay? On, the, uh, so this is, you have to minimize, so sorry, X of J, W is, is one, length one, okay? So this thing here is your basic formulation of the support vector machine optimization. So it's a constrained optimization. You want to minimize the loss function. And one of the difficulties in the loss function, especially if you go to high dimensional data, is oftentimes the way you would solve a problem like this is through maybe gradient descent. But the problem is this loss function is discrete and non-smooth, right? Because it's you either take a one penalty or a zero. So it's, uh, as you walk through, it's very hard to produce gradients on non-smooth functions. So oftentimes, this is not the way that the uh, optimization procedure is actually solved. It's actually solved by introducing what's called a hinge loss. Now the hinge loss is given here, so what you're doing essentially is smoothing that loss function. Instead of being 0, 1 and taking these discrete jumps, this will let you smooth this out so that if you apply gradient descent on here, you have a smooth function and in fact an easy one to differentiate, which is exactly what you like. Okay, so this is in fact the SVM type of architecture for finding, optimizing to find that hyperplane that best separates the data. Okay, um, but that's not what makes SVM special. What makes SVM special is this ability that people learned early on is to say like, well, I don't have to in fact work with just the data X. I can, in fact, work with some functions of x. In other words, I can create functionals of x. In other words, I can take this into higher dimensional representation space through this phi here, which takes me not, doesn't let me, ha, force me to live in a linear space. I can lift it into higher spaces, other versions of the variables. And I'm going to show you concrete examples of this in a minute, but what this allows you to do is if I can move into an alternative representation, which is much richer, much higher dimensional, in other words, project into higher dimensional space, then I do my linear functional here, in other words, my, my hyperplane separation in this new variable. So the goal of SVM is to take all your data into a higher dimensional representational space and then draw hyperplanes separating the data. Okay? So let me just show you here. This is gonna, I'm gonna give you one example that's gonna hopefully highlight this to you. I have data, x1, x2. From that data, I'm gonna move into a new space, z1, z2, z3. So I went from two dimensions to three. And the third dimension I define as x1 squared plus x2 squared. Okay, so I went from two-dimensional data to three-dimensional data. So just to go back, this, this is just this process right here. And I can define projections into all kinds of directions with this. 
And this is exactly what I want to do because most data isn't easily separated with a line. However, if I go to higher dimensional spaces, I'm going to show you in a moment, all of a sudden, lines separate data amazingly well, or hyperplanes do. Okay? So the goal is to project to higher dimensional spaces where hyperplanes can very easily separate your data and give you very good margins between the different clusters. Okay, that's the goal. So here, that I'm going to I give you this example. I've gone from x1, x2 to this, from x to z. What does that buy you? Well, let me give you a really challenging data set, which is trivial now with support factor machines. Here's my original data in the x1, x2 plane. So I have the magenta balls down here and the green balls on the interior. So notice the optimal separation between these would be sort of this circle here, right? And of course, when you do these linear hyperplane lines, they're not circles, they're line, and there's no easy way to separate the data with a line. However, if I now move to the new variable set, z1, z2, z3, where the z3 direction is x1 squared plus x2 squared, this is what the data looks like up here. I have the magenta balls sitting above the green balls. And now I can very easily draw a hyperplane separating those magenta from the green. Okay, so this is a canonical picture of what going to higher dimension can buy you in terms of being able to do discrimination and classification tasks. And this is why SVM has become so popular is because data lifted into high dimensions, you can use linear discriminators very effectively. The cost of this is that if you have high dimensional data, then you're even going to go to even higher dimensional representation. So it's very costly to do SVM in many applications. Partly because what you're doing is going from already a high dimensional state space to just continuing to go even higher dimensionals by making up these other variable directions. Okay, so that's an important feature, but you can see how powerful it is if you can do it. There's one other interesting thing that happened with, with SVM, which is by committing to going to very high dimensional spaces, you get yourself into a very large computational optimization procedure. And oftentimes this may be in fact intractable. However, one of the things that was realized early on is what are called kernel methods for support vector machines. And this is this idea that if I start projecting into these planes, so this is just generic representation to these functionals, then what I can do is say, I'm going to take this w and I'm going to project it into these spaces. Then my functional here is going to be the sum of these alpha j's, alpha uh, phi of x of j's, dotted with phi of x plus b. So what I have to compute here when I go to very high dimensions is this dot product between all of these high dimensional representations of the data. But what people realize in kernel methods is say, why don't, since I'm doing this, why don't in fact I just define that as some kind of kernel? In other words, the idea being, say, I will take this guy and I'll say, since I have to produce this, I will reproduce this as what's called a kernel function. In other words, this is the thing that's killing me to compute because I'm projecting everything into very high dimensional spaces and I'm having the dot product them together. So instead, I'm going to represent that kernel in a much more compact way, okay? First of all, but by the way, here is the, here is now the representation of this thing, which is some hinge loss with these functionals that you want to put up here. So the optimization procedure doesn't change much, but it's now being done on a much, much bigger scale because you have all of these functions you're projecting to. But now what you do, you say my kernel function, let me assume it takes on very simple forms. In fact, for instance, the kernel here could be something like a radial basis function, where all you're doing now is producing this exponential between Gaussian between data points or polynomial kernels. So this is a very compact representation of this thing here, which is typically expanding into a very large space. So what you often can do is say, well, this often can look like a Taylor series, and Taylor series can often be very compactly represented, for instance, by exponentials, sines, cosines. So you do that here instead. So this is a compact way of representing a very high dimensional projection into, into the space, but the compact representation gives you a very tractable way 
to compute this. So these kernels become really important. It's called the kernel trick because now I just got around having to do a really expensive optimization by choosing some kernel that effectively projects me into an ex exceptionally high space, but I can compute it very easily on the data. So that was a, a really important step forward in the optimization procedure for the SVM because the SVM is in fact highly successful because when you take data and you project to high dimensionals, as the example showed, you can very easily now draw hyperplanes between the data and do a pretty good job with it. You just need a tractable way to go to scale with it and the kernel method does that. There's a lot of more details about the optimization procedures and innovations on this. This is more just to highlight some of the key themes that go along with SVM. And just to bring it back, two key, two key things. Project to higher dimensional spaces, make up some functional representation into higher dimensional spaces where linear discriminants work. And number two, do something like a kernel trick to make that a tractable process. Okay, so let me just show you how to run an SVM inside of MATLAB. Here's the code. So all I'm doing up here is loading the cat dog data. We've been playing around this for a long time. I just did, uh, in the last lecture, I did it with, uh, I took the dog cat data and showed how to do this with linear discriminants, but now I'm gonna do it with SVM. So load the cat dog data, stack it up, pull out the features and the labels, and now, Let's run an SVM on it. So this is, should be fairly standard by now. And here's what we do. Fit, C, SVM, training data, and labels. And it's gonna give you back this thing, object called a model, MDL. Okay, so I'm gonna go fit the data. All I have to give it is training data, which is the actual data plus labels. It's gonna build a model. And then if I wanna see how well it works, I can use the predict command, predict, on the model, and now I can run the test set through, and it's giving me the test labels. That's it, okay? And uh, if you wanna use one of the kernel tricks on this thing, all you gotta do is fit SVM. Here's an option, kernel function, RBF, radio basis function. So you can pick different basis functions there as you wish. So this is a very powerful, uh, algorithm that's available to you and allows you very quick access to kernel methods as well. There they are. And so you have this ability to just very simply train on one of these very high-end methods. And what this is doing again is projecting into higher dimensional spaces, trying to build linear classification lines. And so when you give it a test data set, it's going to also project into these higher dimensional spaces. You've built all these linear classifiers or high, linear hyperplanes up there to separate the data and it will give you back your results, okay? You can even get very nice diagnostics out of this. So this model structure, cross-val MDL, so it can cross-validate the model, give you a cross-validation uh, uh, statistics as well as k-fold loss, which is, uh, you know, gives you the class loss across things here. So let's, let's just run this piece of code here and and there it is okay so the class loss here it is five percent so by the way I think that was from previous uh, previous run we had done but that's what comes out of this of this class loss um, from there so lots of good features and diagnostics out of the code and it's very simple to execute and now you have the power of an SVM engine at your fingertips. And by the way, Python has something similar, and you should just have in mind that if you're gonna use supervised algorithms that are not deep neural nets, SVM classification trees, those are two of your most powerful methods available. They're very simple to use and implement. So again, everything can be found here. Code base, some examples, uh, more lectures on class clustering and classification with different techniques databookuw.com, all the code in Python and MATLAB plus data, and all the notes are there at databookpdf.